Mark chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 13, but many of you know it takes me a while to get to the Bible verse. It takes me a while to get where we're going, but we're going to get there, I promise, eventually. Uh, but uh, today I want us to start off with a, uh, with a story that I heard this week. Uh, there's a local, uh, I think it's a Baptist church in a 20, 25 mile radius uh, that, they, that God's just worked on their hearts and they're trying to, to minister you know, we're the church for the rest of us. Well, what's that mean? That means we're the church for those who don't feel comfortable in church, right? Uh, for those of us who don't have a suit, don't have a tie, that don't know what an Ebenezer is and why we should raise it, we're that church for them. Uh, but God still works through the traditional church. I hope you understand that. God still works powerfully through a traditional church that, that's willing to humble themselves and be obedient. Well, this church has said, you know what? We need to do something about There's a lot of kids out there. Uh, that their parents aren't bringing them to church, their parents aren't doing anything to help them get closer to God. So why don't we do something about it? And so what they've been doing on Wednesday nights, by the way, Wednesday nights is the the Baptist time to to worship during the middle of the week. There's nothing in the scriptures that says thou shalt worship on Wednesday nights, but that's when they choose to do it. And so they decided on Wednesday nights that they were going to take their bus, they were going to take their van, they were going to go around, and they were going to go pick up kids uh, and bring them to church on Wednesday nights, which, hey, that sounds great, right? Amen? That's a good thing. Well, here's the problem that they face so far. Uh, we have a phrase around here uh, about kids, and, and maybe you know what I'm talking about. We say that there's some kids that are raised by wolves. What's that mean? That means that their parents aren't involved. Their parents are, are, are absentee. If they are around, they're, 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 they're usually so focused on their phone. They're usually so focused on their addiction. They're usually so focused on whatever that they have no time for their children. And so there's a whole bunch of kids out there, I don't know if you know this, that are what we call raised by wolves. Well, these kids, they've been coming into this traditional church on Wednesday nights, and they don't know nothing. They haven't been taught that you need to be quiet when somebody prays. They haven't been taught that you don't run in church. They haven't been taught that you don't hang on paper towel machines. They haven't been taught that. And so then, not only that, we got kids that are just, wow, woo, running around. They're, these same kids are dropping F-bombs to, their, to the older people of the church. These same kids uh, uh, are, are yelling and hollering and getting in fights in the parking lot, and they're doing all sorts of things. And the, as you can probably imagine, in a traditional church, the older people are a little concerned. Can I say that nice? Concerned. And so right now, the pastor and his youth minister are really struggling because they know that these kids need Jesus and that th- these kids need to be at church on Wednesday night. But the old people are all upset about it. And guess, let's just be honest, the old people are normally the ones that pay the, they pay the bills. And so they're kind of struggling. But what's the problem here? Why are the older people all up in, in, in a tizzy? Why are they all upset? Why? Because they're asking these kids to act like they're not broken. You do get that, right? These kids are broken. They're broken by the sin in their heart and life. They're broken by their parents. They're broken by this culture that tells them that if they want it, it must be okay. These kids are broken, and here's the problem. The old folks are asking for the broke kids to not act broke. But here's the thing that I really believe would set them free. And here's the fact that I really believe will set us free. And look at your sheet. It's this. The fact is this. All of us are broken. All of us. Underline that word all. All of us are broken. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says this. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. What's he saying there? He's saying that each of us have been born with a sin nature. Each of us have a heart that sins. Each of us is broken. So do me a favor. Look, Turn to the person right beside you and say out loud, because I want to hear you say it. Turn to the person beside you and say, hey, I'm broken. Some of you added a hey. That's cool. That's good. But all you needed to say was what? I'm broken. Why? Because why? We're broken. Now, here's the thing. Why is this such a big deal? Why am I wanting... Making sure you get this. Why is it such a big deal for us to understand that we're broken because of this reality? The reality is this. Our brokenness keeps us far from God. Our brokenness keeps us far from God. You see, the Bible says that because of my, the fact that I was born a sinner and because of the sin in my life, that there is a great chasm, there is a great pit, there is this huge distance 
between me and Father God, that I come out of my mama's belly uh, far from God. We see the picture of it in Luke 16, 26. It describes it. It says, uh, there is a big pit between you and heaven, so no one can cross over to you, and no one can leave there and come here. Well, see, he's describing that our brokenness, our, our sinfulness, causes us to be far from God. Our brokenness, our sinfulness keeps us from God. By the way, have you ever felt stuck? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever felt stuck that you can't move forward and you can't go back? Have you ever felt stuck? Guess what? That is a biblical feelings. Every single human being is stuck far from God, far from heaven, far from where they're supposed to be. But here's the good news. There's always good news here at church, isn't it? Good news is this. Jesus came to bridge the gap between us and Father God. Jesus came to bridge the gap between us and Father God. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, there is only one Father God and there is only one go-between for God and human beings, Christ Jesus. What's he saying there? He's saying that, you know what? Jesus came to do for us what we and nobody else could do for us. And that he came to bridge the gap, to bring us close to God. To to take us from being far from God from the moment we're born. To bring us to where we can be close to Father God. And so now you understand what I'm going to say to the day I die. I know we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And I know Easter's not too far from here. But I still say the greatest miracle of all is God saving you and me. The greatest miracle of all is God taking somebody far from God, the sinful, nasty jerk of a person. The greatest miracle of all is God is God taking that sinful person, bridging the gap, and drawing them close to each other. Are you beginning to see then why this Jesus guy is kind of a big deal? Are you beginning to see why churches are created for this Jesus God? Are you beginning to understand why we make such a big deal about Christmas and Easter? Why? Because this Jesus God, he's kind of a big deal. But here's the truth. The truth is this. Jesus is worthless to good people. Jesus is worthless to good people. Jesus himself says in Matthew 9, 13, I did not come to invite good people, but to invite sinners. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, you know what? I want to help everybody. It is clear, Scripture says, that it is clear that God wants to help every single uh, human being that's ever lived. But what Jesus is saying is, while I love to, I want to help all, I can only help those who know how much they need me. I can only help those who know how much they need God. If you want to get close to God, then you've got to realize that you're far away from Him. And so here's the thing. How does Jesus help us? get close to God. How does Jesus bridge the gap? How does Jesus help us to know how much we need God? Well, read with me if you would. In Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. This is a story how Jesus takes somebody who's far from God and draws them close to him. It starts in verse 13. It says, then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. Verse 14 says, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciples, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable, wow, sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law saw who were uh, the teachers of Luther's Hall, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciple, Why does he eat with such scum? Verse 17 says, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Aren't you glad? Amen. Amen. So how? How does Jesus take Jason Keller in Morganton, North Carolina, take Jason Keller and draw him close to Father God? What does it take for us to get close to God? Well, we see number one. If we're going to get close to God, that we have to let God come near. We've got to let God come near. Notice what Mark 2, 13 and 14 says. It said, Jesus went out. He walked along and saw Levi at his tax collector's booth. You're saying, Randy, why did you bring that up? That's kind of innocuous. Who, who cares about that? Well, here's, what, here's why this is important. Many of us have this mindset that we have to work hard to get to God. Many of us have this mindset that we have to, to chase after God. But here's the thing. The Bible clearly teaches through the life of Jesus. The Bible clearly teaches throughout the scriptures that we have a God that chases after us. 
Notice what Psalm 23, 6 says. It says, surely God's goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all my days. Notice what Psalm 139, 7 says. It says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your, sp- your presence. What's he saying there? He's saying that we have a God that loves us so much that even though we were far from him because of our sin, the Bible says that we don't have to work hard to bridge the gap. We don't have to work hard to get to, God, to, get to God, that God chases after us. You're saying, well, Randy, well, how come everybody's not saved? How come everybody's not a Christian? Well, because this is an unfortunate fact. The unfortunate fact is this. Many of us run from God when he speaks. Many of us run from God when he speaks. I, I think of Jonah in Jonah 1, 1 and 3. It says this. It says, God spoke his word to Jonah, but Jonah got up to run away from the Lord. What happened there? God got close and Jonah ran. God spoke and Jonah ran away. Well, guess what? Far too often, we are the same way. You want to know why? Because we know. We know the sin that's in our hearts. We know the, the, the hardness of our heart. We know the blackness of our heart. For example, Jonah knew that he had unforgiveness, vengeful, and hatred in his heart, and he didn't want God close to it. And for us, it might not be unforgiveness, vengeful, and hatred. It might be lust. It might be addiction. It might be fear. It might be pride. But each of us knows the sin that's in our heart. We know the darkness that's there, and we don't want God anywhere near that. And so what do we do? We say, well, let me fix it first. Let me clean it up first. Let me do something about it. Let me fix all of my sinfulness before God comes near. Well, here's some wonderful truth. The wonderful truth is this. We don't have to clean ourselves up before we let God in. We don't have to clean ourselves up before we let God in. Some of you have spent the last decade, the last 20 years, you're trying to fix yourself. You're trying to get yourself right. You're trying to get yourself to the point where you think you can get saved. You think God can get close. And God's like, no, you don't have to clean yourself up. You're saying, how do you know, Randy? Well, notice what Mark 2, 16 says. It says, why does Jesus eat with such scum? Now, some of you are sitting here, I'm offended by that, but here's the problem. It wasn't a lie. These Pharisees were absolutely right. Jesus was literally eating with the scum of the earth. Jesus was literally eating uh, with despicable people. You see, these people hadn't had time to go to no 12-step program. These people hadn't had time to get their act together. Jesus shows up on the scene, boom, he spends time with them. You're saying, Randy, I don't know if I believe that these people are scum. I don't know if I believe these people are despicable. Well, let me kind of help you get a picture of what Levi was like. I recently read about a politician in America. I read about a politician that in 2000 was dirt poor, was so dirt poor that they literally stole furniture from a government building to to furnish their house. That's how poor they were. Now, 15 years later, that politician... And all they've done, by the way, is work for the government, making anywhere from $75,000 to $125,000 a year. That politician went from being so poor that they had to steal furniture that I read about this politician that now is worth $350 million. Now, let me ask you something. How do you think they got $350 million? From the good looks and their charm? Or maybe, just maybe, they're a little shady. Maybe, just maybe, they took some bribes. Maybe, just maybe, they extorted some money. Maybe, just maybe, they sold their influence. Because I'm just here to tell you, going from dirt poor to $350 million in 15 years, it ain't natural. And so if that person walked in here today, or if that person, you saw them around town, say they were from Liberty, how would you think about that person? That you know they've only been making $100,000 a year for the last 15 years, and yet somehow they're worth $350 million. What would you think about them? You think they're kind of scummy? Kind of sleazy? Would you invite them to your house for dinner? That's who Levi was. And here's the sad part. Levi was the best of the lot. The word that was used to describe all of his buddies, they were worse than him. And so when the Pharisees called these people scum, they weren't lying. And you're saying, well, Randy, why in the world did they decide to come to dinner with Jesus? Why in the world did they decide to get close to God? Why? Because they knew this good news, and maybe you don't. The good news is this. It's God's job to clean us up. It's God's job to fix us. It's God's job to heal what's broken. It's God's job, not ours. 
That's why David, after he committed murder, after he committed adultery, that's why David prayed. He didn't say, God, let me clean myself. Let me fix myself. No, David prayed in Psalm 51, 7. He said, purify me from sin, O God, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Why? David knew. He understood that it was God's job to fix him, that he could never fix himself. You know what? It reminds me. It reminds me of our campus pastor, Don Shankle. Many of you haven't heard Don Shankle's testimony, but Don Shankle was an addict. Don Shankle was a whore. Don Shankle was a horrible, no good, very bad person, and he knew it. And I asked him one time, I said, Don, why did you, why did you stay away from church so much? He had a godly grandmother. He, he, his mother went to church. I said, Don, why did you run from church so much? He said, Randy, every time I hung around church, every time I hung around God, he said, I always knew how bad I was, and, and, I, I, and I wanted to fix myself. I wanted to clean myself up. I wanted to make myself right before I went to church. Randy, I decided that I needed to do, get myself right before I went to church. I said, well, what happened? He said, I finally talked to my grandma. My grandma said, Don. Quit trying to clean yourself up. Quit trying to fix yourself. Just come to Jesus. That's his job. It's his job to take away that desire for drugs. That's his desire to take away from that desire for bad sex. It's his job. He said, Randy, I finally came to Jesus when I stopped trying to fix myself and clean myself up. And so, Mike, can I ask you a question? Have you been avoiding Jesus? Have you been running from him? Will you stop running and, and let him come near? Why? If we go, because if we want to get close to God, then we got to let God come near. But notice, secondly, if we want to get close to God, we have to invite God into our home. We have to invite God into our home. We have to invite God in our home. Notice Mark 2.15 said this, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. So what happened there? The first thing after Levi came to Jesus, the first thing Levi did is said, Jesus, I want you to come into my house. Jesus, I want you to come into my home. And what does that remind us? That reminds us that God just doesn't want our Sundays. God just doesn't want our good times. God wants all of us. He wants the most intimate part of us. He wants the most vulnerable part of us. God wants to be in charge of our TV. He wants to be in charge of our Internet. He wants to be in charge of your Netflix account. Some of you need to give your Netflix account a password to Jesus. Because God wants to be in charge of all of that. But here's the unfortunate and sad fact. The fact is this, many of us are Sunday Christians. Many of us are Sunday Christians. And Jesus talks about people like us. In Matthew 23, 23, it says, Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. What's he saying? There? Well, what happened is the audience that Jesus was talking to was very careful to be good on Sunday. They were very careful to be good on Sabbath, which is their, their church day. They were very careful, but these same people that were so careful to be good on Sundays, so careful to be good on the Sabbath, guess what? They were intentionally neglecting their family at home. But here's the thing. Before you get all up in arms, I've noticed that we're the same way. We're the same way. Far too often our Christianity doesn't travel well from the church service. Far too often we'll have a church service here, and by the time we make it home, our Christianity's gone. I was talking about, you know, many of you know we have prayer time on Tuesday nights, and some of the, some of the best folks you'll ever see, they'll come on Tuesday nights. So if you ever think that, that, that if you're going to be a Tuesday night prayer guy, then, boy, you must be awful good. But a brother was sharing with me the other day that, that six minutes after they got home, six minutes after he and his family got home from prayer time Tuesday night, one of the family members was laying on the floor pitching a fit. What happened? Their Christianity didn't travel. The Christianity is here, but their Christianity didn't make it home. And that leads us to the truth. The truth is this. The first place Jesus wants to impact is our home. The first place Jesus wants to impact is our home. Notice what uh, happened in Mark 5, 18 and 19. It says, as Jesus was leaving, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus says, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Now, Think about it. Think about it from the demon-possessed guy. This was a guy that was so demon-possessed that he had been living in a cemetery. He was so demon-possessed that he could literally break chains. He could literally beat up armies. This guy was so demon-possessed. And Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus just speaks to him. Boom. Demons are gone. Next thing you know, the people walk around, and he's dressed. He's clothed because he'd been naked before. He's dressed. He's clothed. He's talking to Jesus like he's having a cup of coffee. And so Jesus talks to him for a while, but then he gets ready to leave. 
And so this guy's natural desire is what? It's to tell everybody. He wants to go with Jesus and tell everybody what Jesus has done for him. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, no, you're not. Go home. Those people that you've abused over the years that nobody knew about, go home. Those people that you treated bad, go home. What's Jesus telling us? He's saying that our first ministry is in our own house. Our first ministry is to our spouse, to our children. Our first ministry is to our brothers and our sisters. Our first ministry is to our home. Uh, In fact, think about this for a second. If your Christianity doesn't work in your house, is it real? If all you got when it comes to Jesus is stuff that works here, where there's this, all this peer pressure to act right, if what you got don't travel and it doesn't go home with you and it doesn't make a difference in your marriage, it doesn't make a difference with your children, it doesn't make the difference in your life, if all you got is church Christianity, is it real? So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus invited to your house for dinner? Is Jesus invited to your house for dinner? Will you make sure that of all the people in the universe that's going to be blessed by your faith, will you make sure that your family is the first one to be blessed? Why? Because if we want to get close to God, we got to what? we got to let him come near. If we want to get close to God, we got to what? we got to invite him into our home. But notice number three. If we want to get close to God, we have to admit that we're sick. If we want to get close to God, that we, we have to admit that we're sick. Mark 2, 17 says this, Jesus told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Now, think about this image here. Think about what's going on here. These Pharisees are in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. These Pharisees are all around them some Jesus. And yet Jesus did nothing for them. Why? They didn't think they were sick. They didn't need, they need, they needed any help. And you see, the Pharisees here are so much like us today. You see, the Pharisees back then, they thought Jesus' job was just to encourage the good that was already there. They thought Jesus' job job was just to help them to become a better you. And they thought that all Jesus wanted to do was come in and pat them on the back and say, hey, you're doing a good job, keep doing a good job. Maybe you can do a little bit better, but you're doing a good job, good job, good job, good job. But what's Jesus say to them in that verse? He's saying that all of his power, all of his strength, All of his love is worthless to good people. What Jesus is saying, in other words, is this. He's saying the way to get close to God is to admit that we're not. You want to get close to God? You want to know why you're not close to God today? Has there ever been a time that you said, you know what? I'm not close to him. How can you move unless you realize there's a need to move? In fact, I want to share with you a startling fact. Some of you might get mad. Some of you may never come back, but you need to know this fact. And the startling fact is this. Prayer alone won't save us. Prayer alone won't save us. You say, how do you know that? Randall, notice what Hosea 7, 14 says. It says, they do not cry out to God with sincere hearts. Instead, they sit on their couches and wail. What's he saying? He's he's talking about these people. By the way, the people that he's talking about, they're praying folk. The people that he's talking about are some of the most prayerful people in all of history, and yet their prayers wouldn't work. Their prayers couldn't work. Their prayers didn't save them. Why? Because all they were doing was praying. Notice what Jesus says. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 7, it says, When you pray, don't babble on and on. People think their prayers are answered merely by repeating the same words over and over again. And you know what? Same thing's true with us. So true of us. Many of us, we, 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 we comfort ourselves and we, we say, Every Sunday I pray the sinner's prayer with Randy. Every Sunday, I say it out loud, and I say exactly what he says. Can I share something with you? You can memorize the sinner's prayer, and some of you have. And you can say the sinner's prayer every day of your life and still bust hell wide open. You get that, right? Because prayer alone cannot and will not save us. You're saying, Randy, what do I need to add to my prayer? Well, if you want to get saved today, you need to add to your prayer. First of all, you need to add conviction. We see that in Romans 7, 18. You need to add conviction. What is conviction? A conviction says, you know what, I'm sick. 
The conviction says this, I know I'm a sinner. I sin and I am a sinner. That is who I am. Conviction says that, you know what, it's not my mama's fault. It's not my greasy grandma's fault. It's my fault. I'm not blaming culture. I'm not blaming Obama. I'm not blaming anybody else. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's what conviction sounds like. We also need to add to it repentance. We see that in Romans 7, 24, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is when God breaks your heart over your sin and it is no longer okay. We see that again in Romans 7, 24, what godly repentance sounds like. But we also need to add to it what? We need to add to it faith. We see that in Romans 7, 25. We need to add to it faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save us. Many of you got faith, but you got as much faith in that chair as you do Jesus. And you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that He alone, only He can save you. And finally, finally, after we have conviction, after we have repentance, after we have faith, then we can pray. You want to know why some of you aren't saved today? You want to know how my wife can listen to seven years of my messages and be lost? You want to know how my daughter can be raised in my house, pray the sinner's prayer with her daddy, and still bust hell wide open if she would have died before she got right? You want to know how? All they did was pray. They didn't have conviction. They sure didn't have repentance. And they thought they could fix themselves. They never put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Here's the truth, though. The sad truth is this. God hasn't answered many of our prayers because we don't really mean them. God hasn't answered many of our prayers because we don't really mean them. Notice what Isaiah 29, 13, it says. It says, the Lord says, these people worship me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What's happening there? These people were just going through the motions. What's happening there? These people, they were singing their praise songs. They were, they, were, they were raising their hands, and they were lifting up songs to Jesus, and they were praying, and they were going through all the motion, but guess what? Their heart wasn't in it. Hear me, FFC. I've noticed that we at Freedom Family Church, we've gotten into this habit of saying, Oh, God, kill my flesh. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. But our heart's not in it, and it means nothing. We're going through the motions. We're going through a habit. And you see, God hasn't answered many of our prayers because we don't really mean them. I mean, think about it. Say you did go to a doctor. But can the doctor help you if you don't admit that you have symptoms? Can the doctor help help you if you don't believe that you're sick? And can the doctor help you if you won't take your medicine? Can he? No. And so my question for you is this. Do you know that you're sick? Do you know you have an incurable disease called sin that is going to cause you to bust hell wide open and never come back from that? Will you stop deluding yourself that everything's okay? Oh, bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bow, every eye closed. bow our heads and we close our eyes and we don't go to the bathroom we sit still why because there's only two people in this room that matter right now and you don't want to do anything to distract people from jesus you yourself don't want to be distracted from jesus and so can i ask you a question my question is this are you finally ready to admit it Some of you are 30, 40 years old, and you've gone to church, and you've done good. You are the good girl. You're the good guy. And all your life, people have been telling you how awesome you are, but there's never been that time that you've admitted what a sick, sinful person you are. Are you finally ready to stop? Some of you have been coming to this church for months, and I see you. I see you during the invitation, and all you're doing is you're going through the motions. I've got people that are serving right now, in this room right now, that I'm not convinced that they're saved. Why? Because they've never admitted that they're sick, that they're a sinner. They've never been broken over their sin. They've never put their faith in Jesus. If they ever acknowledge their sinfulness, they just say, well, I'll fix that. 
and they've never cried out to God in prayer with all of their heart, with all sincerity. Never done it. And so there are people that are going to walk out of this church and walk into hell. I don't want that for you. And so are you finally ready to admit that you're sick? And are you finally ready to let Jesus do his thing? Because only Jesus can bridge the gap between you and Father God. Only Jesus can bridge the gap between hell and heaven. Only Jesus can do that. And so I wonder, do you have conviction? Do you have repentance? Do you have faith? Are you ready to pray? Because if you are, in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer with me to God, then you can be saved. For the first time, you can be saved. You're saying, Randy, do I need to pray it out loud? Yes, I want you to pray it out loud. Why? Because the Bible says there's power in the things that we say. And by the way, there are going to be people all around you. They're going to be praying it out loud. In fact, I'm asking every Christian, every born-again Christian to, to pray this prayer with me out loud. Why? To help somebody beside you, to help somebody near you, to maybe help somebody online. Pray the most important prayer of their life. So I need you loud. I need you proud. So would you pray with me right now? Would you just pray? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me, then guess what? You've been forgiven. You've been given a new heart. You've been given a new life. You've called upon the name of the Lord with a heart of conviction, repentance, and faith, and you have been saved. You're saying, Randy, what do I need to do now? You need to tell somebody. You need to tell somebody that you came with. You need to tell somebody that you know will be excited for you. You need to tell somebody. Why? Because I'm firmly convinced there's a lot of people out there that think they're saved and they're not, and maybe your testimony is the one thing that will help them make the most important decision of their life. And so can I pray for you? Dear God, I just thank you. I thank you that you're still saving knuckleheads like me. I thank you that you're still healing sick people of this disease called sin. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you heard those who cried out to you in prayer with a heart of conviction, repentance, and faith. That you heard their prayer, you heard their cry, and you saved them. And now, Lord, I'm asking if you will, give them the courage, the strength. Lord, give them the joy and excitement to tell somebody what happened to them today. It's in your name I pray.